intuition and, and every other thing. It's driven by something. And it gets down to it gets down to civilization and domestication. I think it's rather clear. The inner logic of it, you can just chart it. It's empirically there. It isn't just some ideology. And if you want to go that far, then that's then I guess you're green. You're a primitivist, you're a Luddite and so forth. If you don't want to go that way, then you then uh, like Elaw. Uh, you're helping guarantee that things just keep fucking getting worse. They just keep getting worse because we're just still scratching the surface and we're not nailing what this is all about and going after the sources of the, of the cancer, of the destruction. That's the way I put it anyway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this sounds really familiar to me and I just realized what Gandhi did is he had to go to the Janus to get support for his movement. And the Janus have this thing called Dharma. It says you're, you've got a responsibility to protect what's important to you. But they also have an overruling factor that's uh, called Ahisma that says, first, do no harm. Well, Gandhi took that to heart. But to do that, he had to go to the what is essentially the one percenters in India. Okay, the Jainists just happen to be the wealthiest people in the entire country. And so that kind of like negated his effort in a way. I mean, when you go to the rich people to say, how do we fix the problem of rich people pushing us around, it's like you've given up. Now, I do not think that that is a bad idea, but I do wonder where the extent of not causing any harm uh, interacts with my dharma, my protecting what I care about. Am I supposed to tear things apart? Am I supposed to do yes. I just sit back and watch it? <laughs> Lots of it. It's just fun. Yes. Um, I'm a practicing environmental attorney and also a long time Buddhist meditation practitioner. And um, for me, there's no um, inherent conflict whatsoever. Um, you know, what you address in terms of conception of the self, in Buddhism, there's a concept of um, interconnectedness of all things. And Alan Watts, who's a Buddhist scholar, talked about the illusion of the skin encapsulated ego, which is basically what you were talking about in terms of limiting your sense of the self to the body. Um, and I think to a large extent for anybody who's, you know, willing to put in serious thought into all the things you're talking about, it's a pretty subjective process. And for me, uh, Buddhism has enabled me to see things more clearly to develop my sense of connection with everything and to be very independent in how I form my values. And being a lawyer is just one way to, um, you know, to try and do something that makes a difference. And how do you evaluate how much of a difference you can make of being a lawyer as opposed to being an, an activist and whether your activism is more personal or whether it involves joining groups. To me, those are more strategic questions. Uh, and if there's anything about your presentation that I was a little bit troubled with, it's what I felt was a tendency to make unnecessary dichotomies. And you addressed that to some extent by saying that it was more nuanced than you know, what you've got time to really get into. Yeah. But still, I, I think it's a great process to go through these kind of thought investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think it's unnecessary to um, trivialize or to characterize as irrelevant or whatever people who choose to act in one uh, sphere as opposed to another. I mean, you just have to look and see what the hell they actually do and what they accomplish. And 
in many, I, I think one of our problems is that nobody's accomplishing a hell of a lot. We're all getting pretty troubled by the whole situation. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and if there's anything I would encourage you is just to not to isolate yourself too much from other people doing maybe a little bit different things. Yeah. I respond to that real quick. First off, um, all my work, and I say the larger this milieu is deeply informed by like, philosophical Taoism, like personally, the Zhuang Tzu, and to lesser extent, the Lao Tzu and the Yetzu are both like heavily impactful in my own work, my own philosophy, how I understand the world, which in turn, I'm sure, as you know, deeply affected Zen Buddhism, Buddhism in general. So, really, like, like none of these ideas are new at all. <laughs> they were just like trying to like recapitulate, you call it indigenous ways, or even like philosophical Taoism. So yeah, you're absolutely right. This is very Taoist. All this is extremely Taoist. Um, secondly, like the whole conversation around effectiveness or that, I personally am uninterested in. I'm not. I get that a lot of people are. Um, I'm only interested in how how they affect the body. And like as a, as a therapist, like, that's kind of like how I view the world. So when you engage and when you sign a petition or give money or do these things, how does this affect your body? Versus when you punch someone in the face because they're kicking a dog, how does that affect your body? Does that make sense? So I'm interested in like the effect it has, and you're like, there's this thing that I like. Racism's bad. I should go walk in the street and carry a sign. Versus that dude's a fucking racist. I'm gonna do something about him. Like, how did, is the act of like decolonizing, directly applying? Um, what's going on and honoring your immediate bodily felt instincts. Does that make sense? But then you have, but then it's the next phase, what do you do? What do you mean? When well, after you, you have to register <laughs> how, how, you, how it impacts your body to whatever the experience is or whatever the thought or feeling is, then you say you're going to do something about it. Yeah, I mean, that's like, what do you do after you do anything? It's like, in my own experience, in my life, and again with my clients, this process is inherently like, it is a, it can create a process to where you are, it, it, it's very empowering and liberating, like wow, I can, I can actualize my beliefs in the world, like I actually have autonomy, I have agency. And that in turn leads you to look in the world slightly differently and hopefully do something else that gives you more agency and autonomy. So it, it can create a very like empowering, healing, a like rewilding cycle, as opposed to like the traumatic cycle, the domesticating cycle, which is like I have no autonomy so I can't do anything, so I feel less autonomous, I just acquiesce to everything. I can't do anything. Does that make sense? Oh. Uh, <coughs> sorry. I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah. We can go on. I would say that there is no end in the power of acting out the rage and, uh, <laughs> and de-investigating yourself, rewinding yourself, and actually having to have the rage in a physical manner. It is like one of the most wild and fulfilling things that you'll ever do. Like watching people just have terror in their eyes because of their own agency. It's amazing. But the question that I have yeah. would be is, do you guys know of any primitivist or anti-civ critique of the rise of the transhumanist movement? Mm. Which is terrible. We're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, by the way, I like, can't well, not like a critique of the movement, but like actually like a study of how. It's like, oh, interesting. Like, in the last month or a couple, of, like a week ago, there was like 300 people that like consider themselves cyborg to take like, and it's terrifying. It sounds like I heard that about <laughs> on NPR. It's just like, and there's like a guy driving around this country with a transhumanist uh, presidential candidate. Oh, Zoltan. <laughs> yeah, it's he's Zoltan. He's like driving yeah. around in a coffin. Yeah, Zerzan debated him, so just type in Zoltan versus Zoltan debate, and you'll find it. So Zoltan's great because he just says things. <laughs> His main. His main objective, I mean, there's a lot of different objectives amongst the transhumanists, they all focus on different things. His objective is to live forever, right? He thinks that insofar as people are dying, um, then, then the project is incomplete, that longevity and, and not only life extension, but immortality is the ultimate goal that transhumanists should be focusing on. Um, what I find of value, I guess, in the transhumanists is that I think there's um, we've talked about this to a certain extent, but these are sort of the two, two um, sides of the coin. Um, everything else in the middle is an incoherent jumble, and there's, there's sort of a primitivism on one side, and then if you're on board with the project, then you're on board with the tech, and you're on board with all that, then you should be a transhumanist probably, right? The logic goes in that direction. So rhetorically, I'm always at pains to try to make 
make these people seem, not make them seem plausible, but make sort of a general public realize that they're not, not really just cranks, even though a lot of things they say sound like cranks. You know, that that is sort of the logic. Falling into his logical extent. Like, yeah. This is where you get Yeah, it. so there's some sort of intellectual yeah. integrity there. They're totally. willing to say things out loud and, and we're willing to follow where things go. Um, Do you know of any? That they're not the actual people they sell? Like, yeah, the, the reason I asked this was uh, last summer I was at a uh, Northeast Anarchist Symposium, which was like, uh, at uh, Liberal Arts College. And there's anarchists there that said that they wanted. Yeah, they're basically transhumanist anarchists. And it's lots of terrifying to refer to the earth as a concept. Yeah. And it's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, I had to leave because I didn't fight them, but um, but screaming outside is also a Yeah, to the, the combination of anarchists and transhumanists being in the same head of the of a single person is it's hard to fathom, but I know it exists. Um, There's a lot of them on Reddit. So Zol <laughs> Zoltan, for instance, isn't really too concerned about climate change because those are, um, you know, clean water and air and things like that are only constraints for biological organisms. And he assumes that by the time sea levels rise, we won't be biological anymore. Uploaded to computers. So if the sea levels rise, that's not really a concern because by then we'll all be algorithms. So that's. That's the logic on the other side of the coin, and I think that you know it's kind of interesting to keep tabs on on what they're talking about. That, as crazy as it sounds, I think that's sort of there's some intellectual integrity there because they're willing to follow the idea to its to its logical end. It's just not where I'm interested in going. Um, yeah, I guess that's that guy's had his hand up. That guy, which guy? Two guys. Sure. <laughs> you, you can go first. <laughs> So um, I'd like to explore this idea of self-extension a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know John. A lot of people have sort of been, you know, looking at the, the examples of you know hunter-gatherer societies, um, small-scale face-to-face societies, and sort of the, the progression into imperial um, expansionist whatever kind of societies has been what uh, sort of led to the where we are. But what we, I think what we, and, and people used to talk about like the missing link, you know, between humans and apes. I guess now that's sort of been, that's been filled in pretty well, so I think we understand a lot better. But what we don't, I think, think enough about is that there, you know, you talk about self-extension in kind of a vague way, but I think I mean, you talk about it from a subjective way, a personal subjective way. But I think what the reality, you know, if there was a real reality to like hunter-gatherer cultures currently, or whatever, is that there was a certain, there was a very concreteness to the shape, you know, of that, that group. There's almost like a group consciousness that people actually, that I think one of the fundamental problems we have in accessing that is that we've lost it. And we can't get it back. Maybe. And people don't really, you know, you know, you know, people live communally, whatever. The, the communes failed in the 60s, you know. But I think there are experiments, but I don't know how deeply people are really going into it. I don't know if we have the wherewithal to sort of reconstruct. You know, there's very subtle relationships, you know, the recipro reciprocal gift giving, like there's there's actual practices, you know, which anthropologists identify which maybe can lead back into the subject of consciousness, but it takes a continuity and it takes uh, you know, a focus you know, of living together, which you know, goes against, you know, what you're doing is great, but isn't the next step like something like really No, creating? it's not. <laughs> you know? It's just it's what's healing. I, mean, that, I guess I personally am not really interested in like working towards a future world. I'm not, I don't think no, what I'm doing is, world, is revolutionary at all. It's completely different I'm talking okay. about. I'm talking about uh, a, a kind of, like, you know, if we want to resist, like, you can't, you need to resist, like, people talk about affinity groups, you know, but you really need to really trust people and really work to get, to, like, to move together as a group. You know, I've had a few experiences where I've 
had, you know, did events and stuff where we like, you got to the point where you like, you moved together as a group. You knew everybody had a role. It's like a, it's like a tribe. But that's what maybe that's what we really need to do in order to really resist what's coming down. We need to recreate something like that. Yeah, I would just say that wilderness therapy is the closest thing that I've ever experienced to that. It's experienced a very small scale, very temporary, very. Right, like a temporary time zone. But we need something exactly. a more. <laughs> yeah. We need something totally. a little more. Yeah. I would just say that like doing these types of activities, doing land projects, going out and actually experimenting, trying to make it happen, absolutely do it. Find friends, go to the woods, <clears throat> experiment away. Yes? Are you, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you, so, um, in reference to, this is, this is for any and all of you, uh, in reference to self-realization uh, and sustainability, in a, in a world where self-realization and sustainability are paramount, do you be, believe that the inst institutions of patriotism, uh, like patriotism to a country, law, lawyers, judges, uh, do you think those things will have a place in a, in a world where those things are paramount? This isn't a trick question, really. It's not. I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to undermine anybody at all. No, no. I would say no, not at all. I mean, there's there's a reason these things spring up, and Paul, I think, was in some ways referring to the record. We lived in face-to-face -face band society for about three million years, and that's what, uh, to some degree, banishes my pessimism or my tendency to pessimism when it appears. If that's so, this temporary, this 10,000 years is not much compared to that. And people did take responsibility and accountability. Their, the survival of the group often depended on it. And so you didn't, before there were all these divisions and gradients of power and specializations, there was no, there was no use for the rest of it. It wasn't mass society. There is now, where if you've got a problem, you call some expert. I mean, there was nothing like that then. We walked on this earth capable of, of everything, everything we needed. Now we, we're so de-skilled and, and reduced and separated that it, it's just, uh, I, I can't, I can hardly imagine anyone, well, I can imagine people wanting it because what else do we know? I mean, what else are we fed? But what, what would there be to justify keeping these things that have turned out so disastrously? Thank you. I think that's an incredibly uh, um, useful and intelligent statement. I appreciate it. Yeah, just to add on to that, I guess I would think that all of these institutions, and really mainstream politics as a whole, in a way, are attempts to make, make mass society work. And to the extent that it's unsatisfying, it doesn't seem like it's a workable solution, but it's this desperation to try to make it work. And I think that's what divides sort of a more liberal from radical perspective is, you know, do we want to keep trying to make this work or do we want to scrap it? You know, so I'm not really interested in making it work. I'm trying to make it work much longer, so I think keep. Yeah. So this is directed towards John. So we've got, you know, this many billions of people on the planet and uh, obviously the hunter-gatherer society was really the only sustainable society. We started with the agriculture run, it kind of set us off on this point where we are now. But with this number of people, if we had a hunter-gatherer society, we would denude the natural world so quickly. And most people don't even know what you can eat, you know. That how would you do it with the amount of people that we have on the planet today? Well, that's, that's just a, I mean, I don't know, that's just a, such a mammoth challenge. How you go in that direction, how you make connections to, uh, find alternatives real, you know, in a practical sense in terms of a process or a transition. I think we can hold it up as a as something to think about. And also identify the reasons why there are seven billion people. I mean it's it's, it's not a natural occurrence. First of all, domestication was a spike. Not absolutely because there were so few people, but but relatively, and, and the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago, that was an enormous spike, and it just keeps going. If you keep if you keep all these institutions that 
cause that, then then there's no way out. You're just you're just a, it's a bystander, you know, or, or passively watching. But I, I don't know. I have no idea what, what's going to happen. Or I, I guess I think it's nothing's going to happen until and unless people just get sick of this. That this void, this empty suicide trip is 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 ridiculous. And their kids are are going to have a even more impoverished and crazy world than this one. That might happen or might not. You know, who knows? But if, but if people haven't, well, anyway, I'll just drop that. Yeah. That's but you're a, that's the question. The question. You know, the question is, how do we move towards? I mean, how do we do it? We've got this many people on the planet. We don't. We don't. It's no one's going to do that. <laughs> I re I reject that completely. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a surrenderist. People uh, once it seems to me. Not inconceivable that more dialogue brings these things to people's attention. If they're just watching TV and so forth, uh, then they have no idea. They're not supposed to have any idea. It's forbidden. Think Charlie Rose is going to have any of us uh, anytime soon <laughs> to kick this out and, and raise these challenges? It, it's you know there are gatekeepers on the left as well as the right, and and that has to be they have to be uh, somehow moved out of the way. And then possibilities may arise. Do you want more? Yes. Oh, oh, sorry, I was pointing that. Oh, sorry, she had her hand up before you. <laughs> sorry. Um, I liked the transhumanist conversation being brought in. Um, Chris, I know that people who conceive of a large vision tend to think, well, what's next for human evolution? And the whole idea that we can transcend our biological selves, our earthly selves, um, I would agree it's terrifying. Um, but I also think that kind of when I hear you speak about, you know, this whole this civilization, it's, it's, it's a mess. We need to scrap it. Well, the way of nature, as I've seen it, is that it makes use of that which it no longer needs, or that which does not serve. So rather than have the idea that we scrap it and throw it in waste like in the ideal landfill, is there a way to actually make use of technology or to make use of the things that right now plague us, you know, how, how do we change our conception of that so that it's not just like, fuck that, let's choose this. Because then again, like, that, that's the dichotomy thing, you know, where this is bad and this is good. But it ultimately is the, you know, reconciliation opposites. We want to get to Buddhist oneness and, you know, then we need to, that's part of it too. So what, is, what does that look like? Okay. Well, the, uh, the use of technology, I think, is largely a dodge. I wonder how many hundreds of millions of people in the minds are Buddhists thinking about the oneness. And what I'm getting at is, you don't have, we don't have the technology without the slavery of people all over the world in the mines and the smelters and the factories and the assembly lines. None of this exists without that. That's, that's, the, that's one of the hidden things. It's, it's, terribly obvious when you think about it. Couldn't be more banal, but you know, but we always lose track of that. Yeah, so it, it, kind of, it kind of takes the place of the question about how to use it. The question is, what is it? Where does it come from? What does it rely on? How did that happen? The use thing is, is kind of not as important, I would say. And in many ways, we don't have any choice but to use it, right? to the extent that we want to um, communicate with others and that our options have been systematically limited, um, we'll use whatever means are available to us, right? Um, in addition to that, you know, even if things you know, crumble, you know, people will still make use of whatever, whatever is at hand to eke up their survival. If the institutions that we think of as being in place, you know, are losing their legitimacy and are becoming less reliable, right? We'll still have to sort of use what's available to us. We're up. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank Hanging you. out.